Shalom, everyone. Thank you for joining me. This is Jackie Yaki of High Adventure Ministries. And today, my very good friend, Barry Siegel, right from Jerusalem, Israel, is going to be doing an episode of his series, Roots and Reflections. Oh, it is wonderful. And it's about different places in Israel. You're going to be there to see and learn some biblical teachings right in the Holy Land. Come on, let's go see what Barry has to say. The psalmist declares, walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers, mark well her bulwarks, consider her palaces. On this Roots and Reflections, we're going to take up that exhortation, walking all around Mount Zion. But is this really the Zion of David? The name Zion moved. Uh, the mountain didn't move. In, Bible, in the Bible, uh, we read a verse, Psalm 48, that talks about Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Well, if you look at the map today, Mount Zion is on the side of the west and south, outside the city. And you say, what happened? The mountain moved to the west and to the south over time. And uh, that's what we have as Mount Zion today. You know, Mount Zion typifies, you know, the, the place and the area where God is going to pour out His Spirit and fill, uh, again, the sons of Greece, those who believe His word, and touch, uh, again, the, the entire nation as well as the world, the nations of the world. This model of Jerusalem in the first temple period, the time of the kings of Judah, shows how the original city of David, including the Temple Mount, expanded westward, eventually absorbing Mount Zion into Jerusalem. Three millennia later, in 1948, the reborn state of Israel was fighting for its survival, with battles raging in the very city chosen by King David as capital. After a long siege, the Jewish quarter fell to the Jordanian Arab Legion. Jews were again forced to flee synagogues and homes where they had lived for centuries. However, in a counterattack on May 18, 1948, the Harel Brigade of the Palmach at least succeeded in taking Mount Zion, which for the next two decades served as Israel's front line next to the old city. This position was precariously separated from West Jerusalem by the steep valley of Gehenna. Look at this! This is a half cranked, tough to move invention of Uriel Hefetz, who was an Israeli soldier in the Engineering Corps during the War of Independence in 1948. In fact, this cable car went the length of 200 meters to Mount Zion, rising 50 meters above the Ben Chinom Valley, and was lowered during the day so the Arab Legion armies couldn't see it but by night it was fully put in use to evacuate the wounded soldiers and people as well as sending food supplies, medical supplies and of course ammunition to fight for Israel's survival. This was one incredible invention by one incredible man and it was only revealed to the public in 1972 up to Mount Zion. The cable car museum is well worth a visit on the way to Mount Zion. The actual gondola car remains suspended above the valley floor as a memorial of aspirations to return to the Jewish quarter. Since the cable car is no longer running, the way across is on foot with a detour down the valley. Coming out of the sewers of the Gehenna Valley, this was a pretty stinky place considering a lot of bad things went on here. 3,000 years ago, this was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. This valley is associated with fire. It is synonymous with the word hell or Gehenom in Hebrew. This valley is associated with abomination and child sacrifice. As parents offered their innocent children and babies to the ancient fire rituals worshipping the pagan idol Moloch, they eased their seared consciences thinking they were doing a good deed. 
The abominable high place in the Valley of Gehenna was called Tophet, which suggests in Hebrew a place of drums, which were beaten to drown out the screams of infants burned to Molech. The smoke of blazing pyres rose above Gehenna. Thankfully, the righteous King Josiah ended the practice of baby sacrifice, and he defiled Tophet, which is in the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Jeremiah later prophesied that the place would be used as a cemetery. The secret passage to a keldama, four fingers in the holes of the rock. This is a keldama, the field of blood. After Judas betrayed Jesus, he said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. The chief priest decided to take those 30 pieces of silver and buy a burial place, a potter's field to bury strangers in, here in the field of blood in the Valley of Gehenna. And talking about a place to bury strangers, next to a keldama is a little visited crusader vault, used as the last resting place for prominent members of the crusader kingdom of Jerusalem. Nearby, the valley walls are honeycombed by second temple period tombs. Jeremiah was right. Time to get back to Mount Zion. I mentioned that it stood on the front line for 19 years, as the forward Israeli position next to the old city. Jews crossing the valley to get as near as possible to the holy sites face sniper fire along the pilgrimage route up to Zion. From 1948 to 1967, Jewish worshipers came up to Zion along this path, which is now abandoned. In those days, it actually sheltered them from sniper fire, but brought them one step closer to the Western Wall and the Temple Mount. At this spot for 19 years was the closest position that Jewish worshipers could get to the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Join Jackie Yaki and High Adventure Ministries as they embark on a journey of a lifetime to Israel's. Take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee and be baptized in the Jordan River. Travel to Masada, Nazareth, Mount Carmel, Caesarea, and Bethlehem, the birthplace of Christ. Then walk where Jesus walked as you explore the magnificent city of Jerusalem. Base is limited, so call 1-800-517-HOPE. Make plans to attend today. That's 1-800-517-4673. The area of Mount Zion has changed a lot in 2,000 years, yet one practice carried on today as then is visiting the tomb of King David. Accessible through the courtyard of a yeshiva and synagogue, it is marked by a dark tombstone covered in velvet cloth. Twenty centuries ago, it was different. The tomb was housed under a monumental structure capped by a solid stone pyramid as seen in this Holy Land model of ancient Jerusalem which follows the description of the ancient Jewish historian Josephus Flavius. David's tomb was probably comparable in size and shape to the Second Temple period tombs in the Kidron Valley known as the tomb of Zechariah and the monument of Absalom. Obviously this structure in its current form didn't exist here 3,000 years ago. But 2,000 years ago, we read in the writings of Josephus that there was a tomb, the tomb of King David in the area of Mount Zion. Pilgrims from all over came to venerate and show their respect and come visit the tomb of King David. On the rooftop above King David's tomb, behind me is the King David Hotel. I wonder if King David ever thought a hotel in Jerusalem would be named after him. Which brings up a good question. Who's collecting royalties on his name today? I'm a son of David, oh, let's go check it out. Below the minaret is the traditional site of the upper room, where the disciples were instructed to prepare the Last Supper. As with David's tomb directly underneath, the upper room did not look like this 2,000 years ago. The hall is actually a part of a crusader church and received its present form from the Franciscans who purchased it in 1335. Later, it was turned into a mosque. No one knows the exact location of the original upper room, but it could have been somewhere on Mount Zion. The important thing is that these traditional sites offer a focal point for devotion. Here, Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover, the Last Supper. 
Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshua, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man, and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. <laughs> This, in fact, is where the Messianic movement began 2,000 years ago, as we read the account in the book of Acts, when the day of Pentecost, or Shavuot, had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. There's a rabbinic uh, tradition that uh, talks about the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Of course, the Feast of uh, Shavuot, or Pentecost, is uh, traditionally exactly the time when the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. Uh, that at the time of the giving of the Torah, the Word of God appeared as tongues of fire, coming down out of, off of Mount Sinai and spreading out over the, over the people. Seventy, it says, because seventy was the traditional number of the nations of the world, the seventy 70 Gentile nations, and uh, that the people could actually hear the words and see them at the same time with the fire. Uh, so this, this itself is already a very interesting parallel for the day of Pentecost. It's clear from the context that the crowd mentioned there is a crowd of uh, people coming for the festival, uh, pilgrims, who have expanded the city uh, greatly. To, to come in for the Feast of Shavuot, and um, that uh, they were there to do uh, mitzvot, commandments. One of the mitzvot was to take your tithe, your second tithe, and spend it for anything you wanted, as long as you spend it in the holy city. Uh, so that was uh, holy tourism, and uh, we still have it with us until today. Obviously, you know, the first century congregation uh, comprised with Jewish people, local believers who believe the Bible and the prophets. We believe in the Bible and the prophets, so let's take a devotional break with Batya and a worship song. For your donation listed on the screen or more, we would love to send you our latest music DVD called Timeless Sounds, produced entirely in Israel. Where have 
all the messianics been hiding since the early centuries of the Christian church. In fact, an inscription was discovered on Mount Zion with the name inscribed Yeshua, Yud Shin Vav Ein, which evidence points towards the presence of a strong messianic community here on Mount Zion. Well, it's time to come out of hiding and discover our roots. Reflecting on those roots, ceramic tiles are available at some Jerusalem shops depicting the early Hebrew Messianic inscription, Yeshua. The um, size of the community, we have very little evidence. Everybody knows the evidence from the New Testament, 3,000, 5,000, and then uh, myriads mentioned in chapter 21 of Acts, which would be tens of thousands. But in all three of those occasions, we were talking about a pilgrimage feast and the numbers could have been swelled by people from outside the country. We have uh, an indication that there was a vibrant uh, community of Jewish believers in the city uh, for the next generation. And then when the war came uh, against Rome in 66, somewhere between 66 and 70, part at least of that community fled the city, went east over the Jordan River about the same time that the Pharisee community was uh, fleeing and going west down to the coast. 2,000 years ago, the entire slope of Mount Zion all the way down to the Pool of Siloam and the city of David was encompassed by the walls of Jerusalem. Wealthier citizens lived in the upper neighborhood of Mount Zion. Humbler dwellings crowded the lower slopes with stairs serving as street access from the bottom of the Tyropean Valley. It was up this slope that Yeshua was led after his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane to the house of Caiaphas, which stood in the wealthier neighborhood. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and elders were assembled. After the arrest of Jesus in Gethsemane, the most direct route to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, would have been up these steps where Jesus was taken. They date back to the Second Temple period, and in those days were within side the walls of the city of Jerusalem. At the top of the stairs on Mount Zion is the church of St. Peter and Galakantu, named after the episode of Peter's triple denial of Jesus. Galakantu is Latin for rooster crow. The present church was built in 1931 by the Catholic Assumptionist Fathers atop earlier Byzantine and Crusader churches, which in turn were constructed over the wealthy Second Temple residential quarter. The rooster that crowed here three times got a permanent memorial. <laughs> what a heart-rending story when we consider Peter and his frailty as well as some of the disciples, for it is here in this courtyard that we remember the scripture in Luke. Having arrested Jesus, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled the fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat amongst them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. But he denied him, Yeshua the Messiah, saying, Woman, I do not know him. As the story goes on, Peter denies Jesus three times and the rooster crows. Under the church where the house of Caiaphas the high priest stood is an underground complex and in this complex is a pit. Now in the Gospels it refers to Jesus having been held before he was taken before Pilate. He was held at the house of Caiaphas the high priest. Possibly this pit or dungeon is the place. If Jesus was kept in this dungeon room, he would have been lowered by ropes through the hole in the ceiling to this dungeon pit. This may have been the uh, house of uh, Caiaphas. We're not sure about that, but it's a good possibility. And uh, that then Jesus was held in a, in a pit in the ground that he would have been lifted up by ropes, much like Jeremiah had uh, had happened to him when he was lowered into a pit in the mud. We're not given any indication that uh, Jesus was in the mud or anything, but um, it, it could have been if it was a, some kind of cistern at that time of the year. It was right after the winter rains. It could also have had water in it. We don't know. This line shows us the present-day walls of the old city of Jerusalem, but 2,000 years ago, the walls were much greater, which were inclusive of Mount Zion. It is here that the house of Caiaphas stood. 
During the Byzantine period, between the 4th and 6th centuries, the Temple Mount was left desolate as we see here in this model of Jerusalem dating back to that time. Nevertheless, the Byzantine authorities did allow Jews to come up and mourn the loss of their temple once a year on the 9th of Av. Throughout the rest of the city of Jerusalem at that time, it was prospering under Christianity, and churches sprang up all over. The Nea Church, which in Latin is the New Church, St. Peter of Galacantu, the church down at the Pool of Siloam, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, churches sprang up all over as the population grew because of the influx of pilgrims from all over the world. On this edition of Roots and Reflections, we have not been getting enough food. I'm hungry, so let's get a snack from a nutty sweet vendor on Mount Zion. And which one would you like? <laughs> so, I'll take one with the walnuts. Nice big size. What do you want? I'll take a pistachio. And he'll have pistachio? Okay. This is a nutty business, but this is freshly made walnuts into a kind of candy bar. And pistachios. One for me, and two for me. There you go. Thank you. Wow. Walnuts. I'm Mount Zion. This is a nutty business. Mount Zion is home to many yeshivas, and that brings us to the word of the week. Yeshiva. What is the meaning of yeshiva? The sit, the shevet, the sit down and learn. That's it. The shevet, sit down and learn. Yeshiva has been always a term that, that, that accompanied the Jewish people. It wasn't life. There was no life without sitting after food, before food, in the evening, sitting around the Word of God and discussing the plan of the purposes of God for His people. She is the place where they sit in God's presence and learn His laws. So yeshiva is a learning place that's really a, a, it's a school. A school for learning for all nations. All nations. But uh, exactly, all nations are all. Whoever wants to learn about God, he has to sit. Because there's no way, there's no way how to, to know it without sitting. If you sit and you learn, then, then you know it. Being in a yeshiva is not only learning the text, it's also seeing, the main thing is seeing a live example from the rabbis, how to act and how to treat one another in all ways. Let's say in the kitchen, you eat, so you've got to put the plate back. So it's, 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 it's a life uh, thing of learning. It's not only this in the text. The Talmud way how to put things out is through a question and an answer. So it sharpens the text when it's through a question and an answer. But if you just read a text that feeds it to you in a spoon, you're not using your brain. So that's why it's, it's uh, made in this way to, uh, that uh, you understand different things. But in the Torah, there's also a lot of parts. That's why you need the rabbis that do the certain things that you can see in the text that yourself that you don't need the rabbi for. But you need the rabbi to give you the tradition that are over the text more than what it says inside. But especially the Asper Yeshiva is special by opening the doors to everyone. That, that's the specialty that we have here to all the diaspora, especially in Mount Zion and King David. But David's Psalms was for everyone. So the, the yeshiva has to be for everyone and everyone that wants to come and know about Judaism. Rabbi Goldstein gives us an exclusive tour of a section not open to the public. A secret cave with an ancient tunnel access to a spot below David's tomb. Earlier we noted the layers of Mount Zion, with the minaret towering above the holy sites. Watch your heads. This cave offers access to a layer dating to antiquity that is even lower than the tombstone. And it's the closest spot to King David's tomb. Where the roof is, is that's where, uh, that's the highest spot of the tomb. And then that's also like you have the Muslims there, if you see the, the thing there. And then on the, the bottom is the Christians, is the Last Supper room. And they also have like a little thing. And then the, the, the lower floor, the floor, is where the, the Jewish people come and that's where we see the, the thing. But now here it's below all these. And this is like really the actual spot that right by the tomb. So the lesson we can learn about being close to King David's tomb is 
He that is highly exalted shall be brought down to the earth, but that which is brought down to the earth shall be highly exalted. And below here is another floor. There is another way to get to the passage of 40. There's a 40 meter uh, place where the grave supposed to be the grave of King David. This is only King David is only a symbol place of where the where the entrance to the grave is. But it's not the grave itself. The grave is further down, and therefore it's a very but special. The grave is located here. They know yeah. that. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Look, nothing's for sure, but it's handed down tradition through Josephus, through Darizal, through the Baba Cherebi, through many many sources. This is the place. From Mount Zion, people enter and leave the walled city through the Zion Gate. In Arabic, it's called the Prophet David's Gate because of David's tomb. The area around Mount Zion has a number of cemeteries. Oscar Schindler, an industrialist, was a member of the Nazi party, but became a righteous Gentile and saved hundreds of Jews. He is buried here on Mount Zion. Thank you for being with us in Roots and Reflections, our program from Israel, bringing you insights to the land of the Bible, its history, natural beauty, people, food, tourism, and much more. Your donations to help produce Roots and Reflections are much appreciated. Well, thank you for joining me again today. That was wonderful. I also want to thank my good friend, Barry Siegel, the president and founder of Joseph's Storehouse. He's our partner and friend. Now listen, let me remind you. The Bible says for all those who want to prosper and who will prosper, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs> Hey!